Okay, I'd like to introduce Mike Collins. Uh, Mike is a uh, mechanical engineer and project lead at, in the Solar Technologies Group of CSIRO Energy. Uh, he has over a decade of experience in mechanical, optical, and thermal design, construction, commissioning, and operation of solar thermal collectors and receivers. He now manages the Heliostats project within Astri and leads mechanical design and commercialization of Cicero's Heliostat technologies. He led a $2.4 million collaborative project to develop Heliostat technologies suited for deployment in remote Australian conditions. Mike is the recipient of the 27 our 2017 John Phillip Award for Excellence in Young Scientists. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Mike. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Uh, thanks everyone for coming along this morning and showing interest in uh, what we're ha what's happening in Heliostat research in Australia. Um, I work for CSIRO, who's a member of ASTRI, the Australian Solar Thermal Research Institute. And I'll be presenting a, a progress on what we've been up to over the last um, seven or eight years in Heliostat research in Astri. So there's a lot to cover um, and uh, we'll hopefully fly through lots of slides, but um, I'm, I've put some details on each slide. So hopefully there's time to go back and look those slides later on and you'll be able to pull out the information that interests you. So um, there's, there's lots of information there, so we won't be able to get into the detail, but we'll hopefully cover a broad spectrum of work. So ASTRI is a consortium of leading research institutions in, New South, in, in Australia and the CSIRO, which is the Australian Federal um, Science Agency. It's, it's an 11 year, $100 million program uh, funded by uh, the institutions, CSIRO and $50 million from ARENA, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. And it was established in late 2012. And we had, uh, it was really established to facilitate the commercial uptake of solar thermal power in um, in uh, technologies in Australia um, and with an approach to really build on uh, capability and capacity. So uh, the first embodiment of Astri ran um, with an aim to build that capacity in Australia, looking at new technologies and opportunities to reduce heliostat um, costs, uh, or solar thermal costs really, across the whole um, technology suite. And um, in after a midterm review in around 2016, Astri 2 was launched, which was looking to focus on technology demonstration and commercial uptake pathways. So really pushing towards those higher TRL, um, uh, but bringing that capability and capacity that had been built in Astri 1. We do have a plan for Astri 3, which is proposed, um, but we're, uh, that's something that's um, yet to come. So some of the highlights we've had in Astri so far is um, just really building our leadership in some key technology development areas, such as technologies for small heliostats, some uh, high temperature receivers, um, the, the verification and testing of some uh, new thermal energy storage technologies from some of our commercial partners, looking into materials and operations and maintenance, um, and some high temperature industrial process heat applications for solar thermal and really trying to bring them all together with our system modeling capabilities as well. Um, we've tried to engage as much as we can with Australian industry in particular, but we've been working as much as we can with the international CSP industry as well. One of our key tasks in the, in the coming uh, years is to really raise awareness and support um, solar thermal power and um, solar thermal energy uptake within Australia. So I just want to plug here, this is not Heliostat related, but it is uh, a really interesting piece of work happening within Astri, and, um, which is our next generation receiver work. We are building uh, sodium and falling particle receivers, which are being demonstrated uh, at CSIRO, um, but in partnership with all of the Astri partners. And there, there's contact information on here. Um, please go and find out more information about this if you're interested. So what I'm presenting today will not all be ASTRI funded activities. I'm going to cover a lot of the ASTRI funded activities that we're working on within the Heliostats project, which is the one I lead, the materials project, which is uh, an O&M project, which is run out of the Queensland University of Technology, and some of the systems modeling work as well, which is happening at, at um, the Australian National University or ANU. We've also included a bit of a brief on some of the background activities within some of our ASTRI members projects that are not ASTRI projects, but are, um, you know, form part of our capability in terms of the member capability. Uh, and we've also got a little bit of a, um, uh, information on some of the activities that we're currently expanding um, for our engagement with Heliocon. 
So Astri One looked at a Heliostat cost down scoping study. This is a, um, a study that was led by Joe Coventry uh, at the Australian National University. And really it's been referenced um, uh, many times um, in the lead up to Heliocon, as well as uh, something that was just similar, uh, a similar process where we really looked for uh, opportunities for cost reduction for Heliostats. And that scoping study led to a few ideas, which were then explored further uh, within Astri One. So there were three heliostat designs um, which were let, which were taken on from there. Um, there's um, publications on on this um, development of the Astri heliostat, as, as it was called, with three competing designs, uh, looking at the sandwich structures, looking at uh, tilt roll linear drives and um, autonomous power and control. We, there was also a, a project exploring the use of uh, uh, rear vision mirror wing. Uh, wing motors to control and actively adjust uh, facets for a heliostat. Um, and, we've, and there was also a lot of interest in this sort of drop in heliostat design where you could place a heliostat off the um, fully fabricated into the field and it would calibrate and self align itself. Um, after the, the review, it was um, in the midterm review, there was a decision to, to target um, higher TRL activities, so really pushing towards um, uh, technology demonstration. And that was really driven by the fact that we could see that CapEx and OpEx costs really need to, um, to drop to achieve some of the LCOE targets in the, um, in the ASTRI programs and the DOE programs which were running in parallel, um, such as Sunshot. And then Heliostat fields were also proving to be stubbornly difficult to do well in, uh, by, in industry. Uh, which was a challenge. And we also knew that we that performance needed to either stay the same or improve if we wanted to look at these higher temperature receivers. So we uh, Astri2 launched a project to demonstrate at high TRL and share information around heliostats. Um, so we, we had this lighter, smarter, more bankable approach to heliostat, um, heliostat research and, and technology development. And it was really split into these uh, three categories um, focusing on research and knowledge transfer to industry based on uh, wind load characterization and some of the FEA tools that we that had been developed, looking at field performance modeling um, and the, the way that we distribute power into a field, um, some of the smart wind stow strategies and closed loop control systems. And then also um, looking at supporting Australian heliostat projects where possible. So where the technologies are being developed in Australia, we're trying to improve their bankability by participating with industry and uh, helping them to test their components and improve the bankability. And we had this separate, uh, this um, secondary uh, technology development stream where we were actually developing key technologies, uh, Heliostat component technologies to try to um, target key pain areas, key areas where we knew there was a, there was a gap. And so we're looking at these low cost facets, closed loop control systems and smart, um, smart wiring systems and also uh, some of the testing and development of um, components for our industry partners. So I'm just gonna run through some of the capability across some of the partners within Astri. Um, the University of Adelaide has its, its key co contribution to Astri has really been in the area of heliostat aerodynamics. Uh, many of you have seen the, our publications. I hope you have, if not, please um, have a look through uh, the vast uh, publications from University of Adelaide on their outcomes from their wind tunnels, wind tunnel experiments. So. Within Astri 1 and Astri 2, the um, capability of this wind tunnel has just continued to grow. Um, initially starting with these uh, single heliostat tests to uh, reproduce and extend upon the work of Paterka and others, um, looking to really understand the way that uh, turbulence um, and uh, uh, tracking angles and other factors uh, impact on heliostat wind loads. We know that wind loads are an extremely important part of heliostat design. So we've uh, expanded upon the correlations for, um, for wind loads, and these are now published um, on the University of Adelaide website. Um, and we've also gone into a lot more detail around uh, the, the way that turbulence inflex, in, impacts on um, these heliostat uh, wind load correlations. Um, beyond that, we've, uh, there's been work to expand this to tandem heliostats. So we know that heliostats are not installed in isolation. So we, uh, the impact of a, a upstream heliostat was then, uh, has been analyzed in, in detail. Um, there's been some work recently on the use of mesh grids. We know that mesh grids are useful for breaking down turbulent structures. Uh, and so looking at either fence 
wind fences to try to achieve this, or even edge mounted devices on heliostats to um, break, uh, break up those turbulent structures, um, which cause high wind loads on, on heliostats, particularly in operation, and, um, and try to uh, reduce the overall wind loads on heliostats themselves. Um, some of the work we're doing now is just starting off is really um, getting an understanding of aspect ratio and gap effects to a higher degree. Uh, so the gap between the ground and the heliostat lower edge when it's in um, when it's in vertical stow. Uh, and the other one is looking at how, trying to understand how we can uh, best model in a wind tunnel the uh, the load on heliostats within a f operating field. So this is some uh, some work which is currently ongoing. The other key activity that we're working on right now is um, this outdoor wind load testing. So we've taken uh, we've stepped out of the wind tunnel and tried to put a uh, and built a out atmospheric boundary layer measuring system uh, using an anemometer array to try to understand the incoming wind and we'll be placing a three meter by two meter heliostat there which is in the lower corner left hand corner of this slide uh, which has uh, an array of differential pressure sensors across the surface and a six-axis load cell to uh, um, really validate our wind tunnel studies um, on the uh, isolated heliostat but just uh, you know, really improve the bankability of this work, in, and um, and uh, the the overall aim is to really um, uh, resolve these questions around wind loads and the uncertainties around wind loads for industry across the world. Now, there's a slide here containing all the information around this work. So please, um, if you need to, if you can go back through these slides and have a look in more detail, please, please do so. And I'm just an acknowledgement of the key team members at the University of Adelaide. Moving to the Australian National University. Uh, in Astri 1, there was a, a lot of work on mirror facet development. At Australian National University or ANU had a lot of expertise in um, mirror facets from their work in large dishes before Astri. And um, some work was, uh, a lot of effort was put into developing sandwich panel mirrors um, to try to uh, achieve high precision um, uh, uh, facet, mirror panel facets. And although they were able to Develop this uh, these panels with excellent optical quality, hitting the aggressive cost targets for um, Astri and for DOE targets um, was difficult because of the, the number of components. So within Astri one and Astri two, um, the mirror facet development work was turned to a single component facet. Um, so we have a single sheet metal component trying to support a piece of glass. Um, this. Rapid prototyping methods were developed to try and you know, reproduce the stamp structures that are used um, by some in, uh, some in industry and trying to see how far we could take this concept. Using uh, um, FEA techniques and uh, some of this topography optimization, we were, able, uh, um, we were able to explore different opportunities to reduce, um, you know, using one piece of sheet metal, which um, would cover the entire back of the, uh, the, the mirror uh, optimize the shape of that structure in order to support the mirror um, for both uh, precision and also for wind load. Um, and through doing this, we've actually developed, a, 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 the ANU has developed a, a novel mirror facet um, design, which is currently, uh, has, we haven't made public yet. Uh, it's awaiting the patenting process. And um, it's a really interesting opportunity to use a single piece of um, a single component to uh, support a piece of uh, a mirror in an accurate way, um, but meeting some of the, um, the requirements um, based on feedback from industry. So if, if this is of interest to you, please get in contact with Joe Coventry um, at ANU. Some, some of this work has been supported by some really detailed um, cost modeling as well. Um, we've, there's, uh, the ANU has an incredible um, field optimization and, uh, and simulation tool, which I'll talk about in a second, and that we've deployed that to really understand what is the benefit of um, slope error and what are we trying to chase when we're trying to build these high precision um, of highly accurate uh, mirror panel facets. And at the moment, based on uh, next generation technologies that we're simulating around um, uh, so high temperature sodium receivers that appears to be a bit of a plateau below 0.6 milliradians. So it really is worthwhile chasing these high accuracy um, mirrors. So as I mentioned this tool that's being used for this work. This is a really impo uh, important tool and I think it will be uh, a great opportunity to use this within Heliocon as well. Um, 
it's a it's an open source tool. So if you want to be involved in this project, you can uh, go and uh, get involved. Um, please contact um, uh, the ANU, John, John, John Pye and Ye Wang are leading some of this work. Um, it's really an incredible optimization tool, which does real ray tracing throughout the whole um, annual simulation, including a really sophisticated um, aiming strategy for each um, sun location within the within the weather file or within the, the annual simulation. Uh, this tool has also been deployed to understand what's the, uh, around the bankability work, is what's the um, uncertainty What's the impact of uncertainty within a, an operating plant? So if you build a plant and then the slope error does not perform as expected, what's the impact on your overall performance of the plant and the life, across the life of the plant? And what does that mean for your project? This is a really um, great tool for understanding the risk um, of that heliostats have and what, why it's important to get heliostats right um, within, within a um, heliostat project. Uh, there's also at ANU, there's also some work around heliostat metrology, trying to understand um, mirror slope and mirror shape. So see, um, these are some of the tools being used at, um, at the university. Um, we've got some work which is just starting uh, within Heliocon um, around camera-based soiling detection. So this, this is already, um, this work has been developed at ANU and is being moved to um, into the uh, Heliocon work, and this is a really around using cameras, color camera images of heliostats to understand slope error. Sorry, understand soiling, understand soiling across the uh, heliostat. So really being, being able to rapidly assess a heliostat for um, for the the impact of soiling on, on in the field. Uh, there's also um, been some work in um, previously in this in the area of trying to stitch together. Um, Heliostat images, which are unable to land on a single calibration target. So trying to understand uh, how to assess those heliostats and, um, uh, and understand what's, um, what's gone wrong essentially with the, uh, with the facet and what's, uh, what's the, sh the slope error is um, in, in the field. So this is an in situ tool, which can be used to understand um, the, 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 um, an existing heliostat within a solar field. Again, I've included a slide here of all of the references related to this work and um, please go back and, and have a look at it in more detail if you wish. Within CSIRO, um, uh, we've been working in heliostats for quite a long time. You may have seen the CSIRO heliostat design around. Um, we've been, uh, this single radial rib facet design is, was developed really as a tool to be able to do this high temperature receiver work at CSIRO. So, we're using this tilt roll, uh, tilt roll actuation and linear actuators to keep the to keep our cost down and, and keep our precision uh, really high to minimise backlash. And um, it really draws upon this really low cost actuator market. Um, we have around we have two fields at CSRO which we use for our um, receiver testing. And the, there's a lot of work that goes into maintaining this heliostat field. Um, we we have developed all of the, uh, the the systems from the bottom up and. Uh, we, the, cap the capacity to, um, to design and continually improve this, this heliostat system is, um, is, is still at CSIRO. We've done a lot of different receiver tests with using this heliostat platform. So we've, uh, you'll see on the left, we've got a list of projects which have um, benefited from our, um, the performance of this heliostat field. And one of the key parts of, um, oh, so, and I should mention here, the, uh, the ASTRI falling particle receiver is currently undergoing testing on, on one of our fields at CSIRO, and the sodium receiver is uh, currently under construction, which will be tested here as well. One of the underlying factors um, of this Heliostat field is our field control software. Uh, we've developed all this uh, control software, which interfaces with our plants, plant PLCs um, so that we can request customized irradiance maps on our receivers and the heliostat control system can deliver those based on um, uh, live irradiance optimization calculations and um, aim point calculations. Um, and the feedback that we, we can provide back to the SCADA on what, we, what is actually being delivered by using the real actuator um, tracking angles um, is then able to be fed back to a, the control system. This allows us to run these high temperature receivers really close to the limits of the materials that we're using um, and uh, in a way that's also safe for, um, for the operation of, of, of plant in this, under these conditions. 
Now this, this Helistat um, control system software is based on our solar tower simulation and opti optimization software, which is called Heliosim. Um, it's a optimization simulation software package developed by CSRO for that can design and simulate full solar fields uh, and receivers, including some of this um, multi aim point um, calculations. And similar to what ANU have done, we can do stress limited um, multi aim point calculations. Uh, and we can do this, we can do some interesting capabilities around um, uh, field layout optimization, including uneven terrain um, and also uh, coupling, um, uh, coupling the optics and heat transfer and receiver stress simulations uh, um, as discussed before. Uh, one of the, we also use this same tool for doing our, high, our really detailed design and um, simulation of receivers for the operation and testing phase at CSRO in Newcastle. Uh, and the code base is, uh, is shared between this system and the control system. And uh, which allows us to bring these powerful optical modeling tools into our Heliostat control software. We've also um, supported a few other research institutes um, uh, to develop and build their own uh, Heliostat systems for testing their own receivers. So we have a small field deployed in, um, in Cyprus. Uh, we had a partnership with a company in Japan and also with the University of South Australia in Adelaide. Now, as I mentioned before, we've got these, a uh, Heliostat system contains many different components and in ASTRI 2, we, it was a really focused decision to uh, develop Heliostat components rather than an entire Heliostat system. Although at CSRO, we have to develop, we have to support the entire system. Uh, you know, it really comes down to trying to package up each of these different components and see if we can assist them, uh, commercialize those and, um, get them into uh, other people's heliostats to try and uh, have impact. So we're working to develop some of these into discrete products as well. So one of the technologies we're developing, and this is within Astri as well, um, is uh, this uh, local energy storage systems. Um, so using a network of energy storage um, devices within each heliostat to reduce um, field wiring costs. So where you have DC wiring in a field, um, such as how a small heliostat system like ours, um, we've demonstrated that using this, um, this technology that we've developed, we could reduce the number of AC connections. So the number of uh, connections in the field where you'd have an AC to DC converter uh, from down from eight connections down to, down to one. Uh, and we'd also be able to use about a third of the amount of copper, although the number of the amount of cabling goes up in terms of meters, um, we're able to reduce the overall copper size by um, using that, uh, to, by using that local storage as an energy energy buffer, uh, where, so that we've always got enough energy to perform safe uh, fail safe um, processes such as emergency scatters and or scrams, um, and uh, but utilize the uh, the copper that we are putting out in the field in a much more intelligent way. We're also working on closed loop control technologies. One of the things that was developed in Astri 1 and into Astri 2 was a uh, retroreflector array based calibration system. So this is where an array of retroreflectors on a target or around a receiver um, could be used to calibrate heliostats by um, uh, if you were able to deploy a camera at each heliostat or near or, or at a group of heliostats, then you may be able, to, you would be able to uh, um, split out the signal from each heliostat um, and uh, either do some par parallelization of, car of calibration or potentially closed loop control uh, of the entire field. Similarly, down this path, uh, we've developed a technology that use, instead of using a, a retroreflector array, it uses a camera array either on the calibration target or at the receiver. And in a similar fashion, it's able to uh, separate the signal from each heliostat um, and in this case, you, you can see a test where we demonstrated the extraction of 30 different heliostats simultaneously from nine, uh, an array of nine cameras. Uh, we do some, a fair bit of metrology here at CSRO as well. And um, uh, one of the key things we've been working on is tracking error measurement. So doing really detailed tracking error measurement of uh, heliostats has really helped us with our actuator and firmware and software and even calibration system design and the verification. And through Astri, we've actually been able to do this work with some of our Australian Heliostat developers as well. 
uh, really to verify tracking error as part of their Heliostat um, development programs. And also some of the shakedown testing we've done around linear drives. So linear drives uh, provided a very interesting opportunity for cost reduction. Um, uh, and the controls, the way you control them um, is something that's uh, always, uh, it has been a very, um, it's been very uh, informative to use these tracking error measurement systems to help us design the control systems for them. Uh, so CSIRO does have some ongoing activities as well uh, around machine vision software, um, some work around the pre-calibration of installed heliostats um, before the, the tower is completed, uh, as well as some um, portable slope error measurement tools that we use for helping, uh, helping industry. And um, we, of course, we're still involved in the operation and maintenance of our own solar fields as well. And yeah, I'd also acknowledge the, the, the team at CSIRO that supports this work. We're going to jump to uh, the Queensland University of Technology, uh, where, where there's a lot of work in heliostat soiling, and this is work that's um, going to be coming across into, um, into Heliocon um, and hopefully uh, have some impact in, in the US market, uh, the US opportunity as well. So within QUT's work, they've done a fair bit of work on uh, soiling models, so trying to understand the de deposition, adhesion and removal process and how that um, impacts on reflection losses. Uh, and one of the key things in relation to uh, the way that this, the, the soiling is modeled is relation to um, is the, the tilt angle of the heliostat. Um, so there's been a, a experimental work at um, QUT to understand how the soiling deposition is related to, to tilt angle um, at their site. Um, and that's really just uh, been a, a, a key factor that's, um, that's helped them with their soiling modeling. Now this individual heliostat soiling model can be um, brought across to both the, um, the field, uh, in the impacts of soiling on an individual heliostat, but also on the entire field. So looking at how different heliostats based on which, what angles they track during the day and across the year and how that impacts on their annual soiling. So you can see that a heliostat that spends more time tilted up um, towards the, towards the towards zenith um, will accumulate more dust and therefore in, uh, experience more soiling. And so this, this is a really key, uh, really interesting opportunity to then also look at optimal cleaning. So if you have a distribution of soiling across the field, uh, then how would you optimize the cleaning um, systems deployed to, to deal with that soiling? So uh, using the, the um, using some excellent tools of using um, mixed integer linear programming, um, they're able to optimize, do a full cost optimized um, uh, cleaning strategy so that the scheduling of a heliostat um, field is done in a way to, uh, to minimize cost. Um, so that you can see here a, a plot of the, um, the, the year and how the different sectors are cleaned. Um, interestingly though, if you compare that to just cleaning on a regular schedule, the cost savings are not actually that significant, so it's um, it, you know it makes it big, it makes a difference, but um, it's uh, it's the impact is not as uh, big as they, they perhaps expected. Um, and and this modeling these modeling tools um, are, are you know are developed for this particular case, uh, and, and sorry the results are, are shown here for this particular case, but it's um, it, this this actual uh, result may not be the case for every site. So there are many uh, where it's very evident that different sites now are experiencing a huge difference in the, the soiling rates. Uh, and these tools will hopefully be able to help uh, heliostat plant developers to optimize their, their, their cleaning planning and how they um, dispatch um, cl cleaning. And one of the key parts in this is in your plant design is you know, making a decision around how many trucks um, you may be required to, um, to clean your solar field. Um, and that really comes down to, and that's where these tools can really assist in, um, in understanding how to best maintain these, these plants. Furthermore, uh, at QUT, there's also work on solar field reliability modeling and staffing. So trying to understand how many staff you'll need to maintain your plant and how to, um, how to best uh, trade off the, uh, the system operation. Uh, and so, there's a, a case study here showing the number of um, 
heliostats that it would be failed at any particular time based on how many people you had uh, or how many teams you had cleaning the uh, cleaning the field. So again, these tools um, are available for um, plant developers to best understand how to um, uh, how to plan and maintain um, a, a field um, and 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 what impact that has on their on the cost of the plant. And um, finally, I just want to uh, acknowledge some of the work at uh, Flinders University, which is happening on anti-soiling soiling coat, anti -soiling coatings. Um, uh, there's a nano rough and glass uh, technology which is being developed there, looking at trying to reduce the, uh, the accumulation of, of, of dust onto the, uh, the surface of the mirrors. Um, and that's, uh, a tech, that's a technology which is um, ongoing. So, I just wanted to sort of summarize, I've kind of flown through a whole bunch of different ac activities happening within Astri. Um, so we do have these uh, ongoing activities which are, um, which are happening up until the end of this year. And uh, we, we'll hopefully be able to share those result, um, some of the results of those um, as, it, as we go on. Uh, we're, hopefully, we're launching activities in relation to Heliocon and contributing to the, uh, the roadmap activities at the moment uh, and hope and uh, yeah, and hope to continue that uh, excellent collaboration. Uh, we're engaged in knowledge sharing, so wherever possible, we're, we're giving, we're trying to share the knowledge that we're generating around Heliostat, um, Heliostat systems and Heliostat uh, uh, wind loads um, with industry wherever possible. Um, we're certainly interested in the commercialization and uptake of Astri technology. So anything you've seen here today, if it's of interest, please get in contact with the um, with the person mentioned on the slide. Uh, or myself, if you can't, uh, if you can't get in contact, um, because we are really interested in having impact. So being able to deliver impact through deployment of Astri technologies, or the use of Astri knowledge that we've has been developed is really key to um, to the success of Astri. So I just want to acknowledge as well um, the funding from the uh, Australian Solar. Thermal uh, Institute is really is really supported by the Australian government through the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and um, I, I will also want to acknowledge the huge team uh, um, across Astri, both in the researchers and the uh, operations of Astri itself, the, um, as, as a uh, as an institute. So, I, I think um, I'll finish up there. I want to make sure there's plenty of times for time for questions because I know that I've um, gone through that at quite a speed. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Mike. That was that was excellent. Um, really glad uh, glad you're doing all that great work too with with uh, the heliostat. Uh, I think you've you've covered the the field so well with with uh, all the different uh, aspects of deployment and O and M and and uh, everything. I think this is fantastic. Um, so we will open it up for questions. We we've got about um, Another another twenty minutes or so for for questions. I, I guess I'll maybe I'll just start off with a simple question. Have you costed your your CSIRO um, heliostat? Do you have a dollar per meter squared value for that yet? Yeah. Look, we we have the um, actual cost that it cost us to build our solar fields in Newcastle with you know the sort of small numbers that we built there. Um, and that's you know that's obviously quite staggering because of the uh, <laughs> the small numbers that we deployed uh, within some of our previous projects we have tried to cost out those that heliostat at a higher um, at a higher volume so looking at um, you know millions of heliostats deployed in Australia uh, and yeah there we do have some information on that which we can share um, the the challenge that we found with that is really getting uh, some certainty around how much components would actually cost in large volumes and that's that's always a challenge when um through the through these systems uh, we did engage some australian manufacturers and um uh and one of the things we found was uh um even through the uh the, the costing model of that is that it's, it's extremely sensitive to the location of the field because in australia we have most of the population living around the coast um, and the actual installed cost is really dependent on how far away the plant is and how many truckloads of heliostats you have to send um, from the coast into inland interior areas. Um, so it's, it's uh, we also have a very uh, high cost of labor in Australia. So some of these robotic systems and smart um, 
sort of self-aligning systems become a lot more interesting, um, it, uh, particularly in these rural areas where the cost of labour is extremely high. You're com competing against uh, uh, mining uh, and other other big uh, resource-intensive uh, industries in those areas. So for labour. So yeah, they're, they're, we have done some work in that area. I, I don't have it on hand at the moment. That would be great. Um, I'd love to get some, uh, I don't know if you have a paper or something on all those considerations. I, I think that would be really important to the Heliocon project as we look to hit that $50 uh, mark, just kind of understanding a lot of the details that might maybe people aren't uh, fully considering. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, uh, good evening. Hi, Mike and everybody. Uh, great talk. I missed the start. Um, I just wondered whether you have any done any work on automated production systems for his that deployment, uh, i.e., you know, in field assembly systems that are, yeah, you know, semi automated or fully automated. When, when we did the analysis on the CSR heliostat, um, the aim was to develop a, um, a factory-based approach whereby the factory was not in the field. In, in, in Australia, um, we were hoping to get to a stage where we could unlock the opportunity with small heliostats to, to build heliostats in a low, lower cost um, uh, industrialized area, such as a city within Australia, and ship fully assembled heliostats out to plant. Mm -hmm. um, that was the aim of that project, and through that, the, we, there was some work and costing the automation process um, in in a, uh, uh, and that was really based around the the, um, as you would know, John, the uh, the departure of automotive production within Australia, so just looking to take advantage of um, of that opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks for that. Well, we could follow up uh, after um, yep. discuss that. So, thank you. I can see there's a uh, question in the chat around the um, availability of the slides. And yes, I, I understand the slides will be available as well as uh, the recording of the um, presentation at the end of the, uh, after this presentation. For that. Um, I wanted to know also, um, what are the main remaining gaps in the, in the field optimization models you have? It looks like it's, pretty pretty comprehensive in the in the way you you choose where the field uh how the field interacts with the receiver and i'm wondering um if there's any uh challenges you you might want to work on in the, in the next few years yeah thanks i think um one of the things that's really exciting about the work that's being done um currently in astri around um I think it's this one here, ray tracing for the, yeah, so around this value proposition, this this work here is really interesting because it's the first time I feel like we've had full flow through of um, heliostat performance parameters into actual LCOE. It's been a challenge um, previously to really assess the, um, the you know, um, to really assess the impacts of heliostat pr parameters in detail uh, into the the impact of LCOE, so we can say, you know, often we would make statements like, you know, uh, low slope error will improve LCOE, but we didn't have a good feel on the quantitative numbers, uh, the quantitative um, assessment of that statement. So I'm really excited that this is something, you know, this is something that we've only been doing in the last six, six months or so, um, and I'm really excited to see that we're being able to analyze. Um, the impact of heliostat performance parameters in such detail on LCOE. And I think um, the, key, the key part there is really having these ray trace basing based field optimization tools. Um, and the uh, and ANU's developed this one here and we, we have one within Heliosim as well at CSIRO. Um, but really about it, it's um, the receiver and heliostat, are so, uh, heliostat field are so, in, um, are so linked in their design that making a small change to a heliostat 
has could have a potentially huge impact on the operation of the plant. Um, and so having these um, sophisticated um, models to actually show, you know, model the, the, the operation of the receiver at many different times during the year for the annual simulations with um, damage models or creep fatigue or uh, stress limited um, irradiance maps on the receivers being considered at every point in time um, is, you know, I, I think is really great um, because it's 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 the way that these plants will actually be operated. Um, and I think, but I think one of the, the the gaps that we have at the moment is, um, uh, and something we're looking to address is to then not just look at slope error, but looking at decoupling slope error and tracking error um, as two separate items within um, within these simulations. So looking at, uh, and that also goes across to some of the uncertainty modeling that's been done is trying to see, um, see how that uh, how that impacts. And I, I think that's a big gap is that uh, at the moment, slope error and tracking error are often um, combined in some of these modeling tools. Um, and we're, we're looking at ways to try and separate them out um, because, that, because it could have a, a, a significant impact on um, certain, uh, particularly on, on certain operation um, points during th throughout an annual simulation. Great, thank you for that. Mike, um, could you go back one slide? Um, yeah, to that one. So where you've got um, slope error versus LCOE, presumably you've made an allowance in there for the fact that um, if you're going to tolerate a bigger area, you're going to have a slightly cheaper uh, cost per square meter of the heliostat. Is, is that included in there? Uh, no, in this round of modeling, the cost of the heliostat is kept kept the same. Okay. Um, so we're trying. Uh, so this this is the sort of first round of of exploring this area. We can we can recast this data to look at, you know, what sort of costs you'd need to hit for to, to keep the same LCOE what sort of costs you would need to get for your heliostat to, to, um, to reach um, for each different slope error. Um, so that you, we could um, yeah, have a look at that yeah. from that point of view. But at the moment we're keeping costs stable and just looking at what happens if you, for the same cost, could make a, uh, could make a better mirror. Yeah, right. A better heliostat, sorry. And I should also mention, um, uh, yeah, I should mention as well that, that we, um, we're, we're sort of approaching the sun shape and astigmatism dominated region. So the reason this is plateauing, we believe, is because we're starting to run out of, um, you know, the, 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 there's diminishing returns once we start um, hitting the similar uh, size of the sun uh, in, in, in its angular size. Yep, thanks. Great work. Do you find that there's a, a difficulty in with, with this type of, of software that you're talking about here, make it easier to switch out receivers and heliostats. You, you talked about the intricate link between the two. And I'm wondering if, if, if someone were to say, you know, this receiver is just not working, do you, how would that affect the field specifically? What, what is it that, what is the technical challenge in changing the field? Um, I, I think, just to go to your first point, I think, yes, the, the challenge in doing this kind of work is you do need a very detailed model of the receiver um, in order to understand the field. But I think these tools need to be this sophisticated when you're, we're talking about a, you know, a, a billion dollar investment for a plant um, or, or similar. Um, and, you know, I, th I think that with the tools that we now have within Astri, we can accommodate different um, uh, different receiver technology. So we're, we're trying to work to reproduce this um, kind of analysis for particle systems as well. So looking at um, uh, multi-cavity or um, uh, single cavity particle, falling particle receivers. Um, and that's something that we're, that, that's some work that's currently underway to, to understand that. Um, so I, I think it's, it, is, it is a challenge to get all of this integrated here, but once we can get it into this workflow, um, then I think it's, uh, it, it's it's the um, it's going to be really informative on on what's important to get right on a heliostat. Thanks for that.
Any other questions? I guess I have, I have one more quick question uh, just to catch me up on, the, on your uh, closed loop control systems that you're working on. Uh, you showed a calibration image with dots and a circular array of dots. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, is there, how far off are we from calibration on sun uh, or, or closed loop control on sun? Do we need the, do we need the dot tracking or can we actually just look at the receiver and try to control while producing power? So the challenge with closed loop control systems is around identifying the image from each individual heliostat within the assembly of, uh, or the, the overlapping images from every heliostat in the field. So these two technologies, which I've presented here would um, technologies to try and decouple that. Um, so taking the, rather than the scalar data of um, how much irradiance is landing on a surface, getting the vector data about where that irradiance is coming from. Um, and using retroreflectors, we're able to separate that in angle and send that information back to cameras in the field. Or alternatively, using this technology, we're able to use cameras to um, uh, sep uh, separate that information and, um, and detect it for all heliostats uh, simultaneously. The challenge here is around fitting these, what could be integrated into calibration targets, which would allow parallel calibration. Uh, while that is interesting in the sh in, as one embodiment, the full closed loop control would require you to integrate these um, systems, either retroreflectors or cameras um, around the receiver or uh, in front of the receiver, either by uh, you know a moving bar, for example, has been explored using this technology that sweeps in front of the, the full field in, um, uh, to, to detect, to allow closed loop control, or alternatively, you may be able to gather information on um, uh, part, you know, missing the components that are going into the receiver um, and just uh, observe the uh, areas of irradiance around the receiver and infer that the centroid of the heliostat is within the area that you're not measuring. So th those technologies, um, these two technologies have been, um, sorry, Uh, these two technologies uh, these two technologies are uh, um, uh, uh, both uh, interesting I think for for both parallel calibration and also for um for close of control and I think there are um, there are uh, industries out there looking already to um, implement closed loop control on small heliostat fields. And I think on, on some of these polar, smaller heliostat fields, this technology is possibly easier to implement um, uh, rather than the large surround cylindrical receivers um, where the, there's less space for these kinds of systems. But I was certainly interested in anyone who would like to, you know, explore the use of these in a commercial system. We've done some simulations on, um, you know, full field simulations on this for um, surround systems. Um, and I, I should mention as well, one of the key advantages of these two technologies is that small heliostats that are distant from the tower where the irradiance on the tower is very low uh, are able to still to be calibrated because of the sensitivity of the, uh, of the cameras or the retroreflectors um, to, to those signals. Okay, thanks for that. It looks like Greg uh, has a question. Yeah, um, uh, Mike, thanks for your excellent talk. Uh, for soiling losses, even under the uh, optimal cleaning, what kind of numbers do you see for, on average, soiling losses for your CSP systems? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I can't really answer that. I think I, I'd, I'd forward you to contact Michael Cholette at the University of uh, Queensland University of Technology to discuss that. Um, I think it really, there does seem to be a really broad spectrum of soiling losses experienced at different plants for different locations. Uh, and there's a lot of detail that, you know, um, that, go, that, that goes into their soiling models around the different types of dust and the adhesion properties and the, um, and the uh, removal properties and things like that. So I, th I think it's one of those questions where it's, um, you're gonna get a very complicated answer um, from Michael. Uh, but a very detailed one. Um, so I, I'd refer you to um, my colleagues there 
Um, Mike, did you want me to jump in there and yeah, Mike, sure. did you want me to jump in there and answer? Uh, yeah, sure. So I, Mike's answer is actually spot on. You know, there's quite a wide variety depending on on the site. Even within some of the sites in Australia, there have been pretty decent uh, variety. But we've seen anything from 0.3 uh, percent per day up to three percent, depending on exactly the things that Mike talked about. Uh, dust and air uh, adhesion properties and and all of this. So you know, we're 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 developing an, a way of being able to answer that quickly, but it's still a very complicated uh, issue with a number of factors going into it. Um, and we think we have a pretty decent handle on many of them, but some of them not so much. Um, so, you know, an order of magnitude between 0.3 and 3% is the short answer. And your modeling and the actual measurements are, are corresponding? Yes, uh, though admittedly it's been done on limited experiments at the moment, not full field validation. So not just this one, we have some other ones that we that we did with some companies where we did some uh, 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 validation experiments in uh, other locations in Australia. Um, and so far the models line up pretty well. Um, how well is very well depends on some uncertainty analysis that we're trying to incorporate in our modeling effort right now as well. So, you know, the, the model match is, is pretty solid. Um, the, the handle on the wet deposition part about the effects of dew and things like that can, can really muck things up, but the dry deposition model works pretty well. Thank you. Uh, if, if I can add something to that answer, already pretty comprehensive. Uh, I think the actual optical impact of soiling on the on the losses of a plant remains uh, a, a fully open question uh, in terms of a big plant with a, with a tower receiver because there's scattering happening because there's some diffraction happening apparently so all that stuff is not actually something that is really easy to take into account into a full annual simulation of a full plant with aiming and so on and so yes it is true that now researchers are getting pretty good at understanding how dust deposits on mirrors and so on, but how that impacts the yield of a plant remains some form of open question, I'd say, from, from what I can see right now in the, I, in the recent research. Completely agree. And I think that the, the distribution across, you know, the, 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 how much the same amount of dust varies the reflectance in different parts of the field, I think is somewhat underappreciated. So there are a lot of underappreciated issues that need to really be, to be studied in CSP specifically. Have you looked at the um, optical error caused by the nano textures that were presented? Uh, that's a good question. I, um, I I'm not that familiar with the with that work, and I'd probably see if Michael has a, an answer, um, or um, otherwise I'll refer you to um, David Lewis at the at Flinders University. I think talking to David is a good idea, but I will say that that's we're we're working with them to do exactly that um, with with some of our, I mean, with their reflectometer and to do some soiling studies uh, on that. And in, included in the soiling studies will be the nominal reflectance characteristics of, of the coating. I look forward to that. That sounds very interesting. Any other questions? We've got about five minutes left. Um, this is digging in a lot of detail, but Mark, have you done any uh, examination of the, the impact of you know, dust being cleaned off mirrors and causing scratching to the mirror and therefore uh, you know, interfering with the spectrality of the Mira, over time. Uh, that, that's a, again, I'd probably pass to my colleagues at uh, QUT to answer that one. I, I don't think we've done any specific work on that at, at um, in Astri, but no, we haven't. Uh, there, there has been there was some early work in Astri about using uh, about optimizing uh, cleaning jets and things like that to enhance dust removal, um, but that work we have not focused very much on cleaning technologies rather uh soiling of the of the heliostats and the need for cleaning uh, i think studying optimal you know the cleaning technologies vary widely out there um i've seen everything from you know the big supcon robot 
uh, that they had at solar paces all the way down to, you know, different, different systems that are, you know, a tractor with a, with a water jet mounted on it. But I think uh, this cleaning system thing is quite understudied um, and its effect on scratching of the surface with contact versus non-contact. I haven't seen any studies to date on that um, and, and would be very interested in, in doing or seeing them. Yeah, okay. Uh, we've got some reflectors that have been out for 10 years. Uh, perhaps we ought to do some tests on those. It would be um, interesting. We'd be happy to share that uh, if I can get that data together at some stage. That would be fantastic. We'd be very interested in that and seeing how it affects the optimal cleaning. Uh, the frequency would be very, very interesting. Thanks mm -hmm. for that. Thank you. Daniel? Uh, so you have a hand up. Uh, yeah, um, a quick question for Mike. So uh, seeing the installation at this point, millions of heliostats and uh, doing some work with industry. Um, so you guys have a pretty wide swath of research from development of the heliostat hardware to how to do O&M. Um, are there any kind of thrusts of research that you've seen might be best just left to industry? Um, or industry partners versus uh, covered by CSRO or ASTRI or, uh, or individual universities? That's a great question. I think that's where we, um, when we steered away from developing a, an entire heliostat system is probably something that we, um, we took based on feedback from industry. So both ASTRI and um, CSRO individually sort of, um, didn't abandon like we, we sort of changed tack and started developing heliostat technology um, with really just trying to uh, sorry component technologies rather than an entire heliostat system and I think by um, focusing on technologies that are you know really uh, have big opportunities for cost reduction or performance improvement then um, and and looking to develop them up to a high TRL um, demonstrating them as uh, as quickly as possible and then saying to industry, here they are, does anyone want to use this? I think that's something that we've been trying to do in Astri and um, uh, and I think that's uh, a, a something that uh, has been working, you know, we hope to, to be able to have impact through that mechanism rather than saying, we're going to develop an entire Heliostat system and try and sell that as one large package. Um, so I think taking it from that TRL sort of seven, eight, nine to, um, to uh, to push up into a commercial product. That's what we need to leave the industry. I think we, um, we sort of need to get them to the, uh, to the point where we can prove the technology works. We can prove that we've thought about most of the issues, um, but really then try and get industry to pick them up and run with it. Um, as far as industry R and D goes, um, uh, I think we'd love to know more about what's happening in that space, but often it's, um, it's a, a, bit, a little bit behind closed doors. Um, um, in Australia, we've had some really great uh, opportunities to contribute to uh, industry R&D through Astri. Um, that, that sort of work is not where, not sort of thing we're able to share um, because of commercial and confidence arrangements. But, um, uh, you know, I think there's the more that research can partner with industry, both with developing new technologies and also taking industry technologies and just helping them with the tools that, in, that research um, labs have, the, the better. And I'm, I, I really hope that looking at Heliocon, we're able to do a similar thing uh, in the US whereby um, the vast skill and um, uh, cap capability within the, your national labs and um, perhaps universities as well can be deployed to really um, have a big impact to the cost of Heliostats and the, um, and the performance of Heliostats as they go on. And, and even, even with the plants that are already built in the US, uh, helping them solve their problems um, as well. All right. Well, I just want to thank you again, um, uh, Mike, for, for telling us all about uh, what you guys are doing in Australia. And um, that is all the time we have today. So um, we will see you uh, on the 13th, where I will be talking um, a little bit about uh, economies of scale, um, field deployment considerations to accommodate evolving energy markets. Um, and that is really um, focused on, on ideas to, to make a more competitive bid for field deployments in the future. Um, 
I appreciate all your time and, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mike.